next panel is going to be chaired by Professor Diana Davis. Um, I also welcome her because this is her first day at the GSD. She's just joined the faculty and she's jumped in and agreed to chair this panel. So welcome, Diane, and I surrender it over to you. Well, it's a great to be here. I'm already very excited about the early morning panel. Um, this panel, as you know, is uh, called Microurbanisms. And I think that in some ways it carries forward and perhaps and hopefully challenges the framework laid out in the prior panel, which focused on, this, on states, politics, formal structures of regimes and regulations, um, whether they're local or international as in with, or global with the UNESCO, and how those regimes create territorial and social order in the built environment by managing, restricting, ordering the use of space in cities. Um, this panel offers, or maybe I will say mirrors, I think that was a concept that came up yesterday, these processes, but showcases um, the, the fascinating and inspiring work of Momo Kaijima and Raul Cardenas, who direct their gaze and efforts at, at the other, at other side of the bottom, what I would term the social construction of spatial order, and how it emanates from the actions of citizens or publics or even private actors in, in the public sphere. Basically, other actors besides the state. All that is not to say that the concept of politics, which, uh, or even the concept of rules of order, which permeate, permeated prior panel, are irrelevant. Uh, and in many ways, we could, we could have titled this panel many things. One could have been micropolitics, not microurbanisms. Um, because politics happens on many scales, depending on the large piece, small, small piece. Um, but I think that the uh, concept of microurbanism is a really appropriate one for this, for this panel, for what we're trying to accomplish, and for the work of these two people, because it really looks at uh, the normative ideas and rules and regulations that govern civil society, how citizens interact with each other and with the built environment around them and sometimes even how citizens interact with the state. Uh, we'll see that in the, in the um, presentations. Our two panelists actually use concepts or with different adjectives of, of kind of smaller scale urbanism in their own work. I just want to underscore, and maybe it will come through in the presentation, Momo has developed a concept called behavioral urbanism that really looks at individuals and their relationship in space and even up to the state. Uh, Rahul, um, has a concept of molecular urban, urbanism, which um, in my training as an urban sociologist, I think speaks to the organic uh, social and spatial relationships between individuals. It really helps us think about cities as organisms. Um, but it's a component parts on the level of, of, of citizens and scale that, that informs his work. The last thing I wanted to say is a framing element um, just to be able to keep the conversation going with the first panel for the rest of the day is I'm thinking that we are going to hear, and I'd like us to pay attention to the ways that binar binaries or bin binary concepts are going to be used and challenged in this, in this panel. And the binary concepts, again, transitioning from the prior panel are maybe uh, state and formal, as a set of ways that we've looked at things, <coughs> formal regulations being embedded in state, formal states, against citizens and informal. So I want to throw the concept of informal here. And I think that we're going to hear a little bit about not just the analytic distinction, but in the real world, whether those distinctions hold or don't hold and how they're negotiated um, in the work of our two very inspiring speaker. So I'm going to introduce them and we'll start. I will introduce both of them um, and then we will start with Momo Yo, or Momo, she told me I can call her, Kaijima. Um, and let me just also say that I think the bios, their bios in the, um, the pamphlet don't do any justice to the wonderful, inspiring work that they do. Um, I've went through some of the YouTube, your YouTube and their websites and interviews, etc. But just as a general formal introduction, Momo Kajima is, is a principal at Atelier Bow Wow based in Tokyo. And also that's another thing, I think it's really interesting that we have an exam, examples of work from Japan and from Mexico 
two countries as histories of one party rule, and maybe we'll come back to that later. So the way that the politics and state and formality and informally are negotiated, that we're going to have some good comparisons. Um, Momo studied at the Japan Women's University and then and obtained a master's in engineering from the Tokyo Institute from the Tokyo Institute of Technology. She's been a guest at a variety of institutes, the ETH, Ed Zurich, uh, where she had postgraduate qualifications. She's been with us here at the GSC, which is great, um, and she had several other um, activities. We also have uh, Raul Cardenas, whose work I know as a, at, since I'm a Mexicanist, and I've often been inspired by Raul's work on Tijuana and, and uh, productions of space in context of violence. Uh, Raul has many, many, wears many hats all the time. He's the founder of an organization called Toro Lab, a collective workshop of contextual studies that identify situations, um, uh, quotidian situ situations in everyday life for research. Um, he focuses particularly, and I think that theme will come up in our, our reflection on micro-urbanism, what quality of life means from people who live in the city itself. Um, and uh, you have been here at the GSD as well. I heard you give talks all, all over the world. So uh, I, without further ado, we'll start with our two speakers beginning with you. <coughs> Happy to be here to have lecture here and uh, talk to you and discussion to you. So, and then um, the first image is uh, what I did in general. <laughs> so this is um, our uh, some of the small house project. But uh, for this conference, uh, I I, uh, I I don't uh, show anymore. So these kind of things. <laughs> so um, I would like to show some another new image of the new trial uh, from the Atri Bauer. Um, my recently so we realized that architecture is a social framework, uh, like this uh, building, uh, like this on the picture. So the, the structure was supported to many people, and many people are uh, organized by the by kind of social uh, form. And also, this is a very uh, traditional Japanese uh, roof uh, making image by straw bale, the rice uh, straw bale. And then it's also the symbol of the uh, local community uh, for making the one uh, house. And uh, in Japan, the traditionally, the village view is like this. Um, the old landscape and old house were built by them. And then also, the, they still so uh, keep the kind of the community uh, through the making the landscape. And my one thing is that I, my, I doubt or uh, I uh, ask me to, so what is the role of architect today? The, this is a very famous <laughs> um, my Japanese film by Kurosawa, The Seven Samurai. So architect is samurai or not? <laughs> and then in fact, the, 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 these seven samurai are working for the village people to uh, fight the, fight the, the ruber uh, the, who attacked the, the village. And then the, some of them uh, die through the, this uh, war, and some of them are uh, married the, with the young uh, village, uh, village girls. So I don't know exactly what I am or how I can do for the village or for the locality. But uh, I think this is a very good model of the Japanese society, how, to, how we can work as an outsider to, to the uh, local. And then I give some so, um, my keyword today. So the, I just uh, make a simple the line so that from people and the social experiment, and the civil engineering and architecture, and the politics, and the academic network, and students. And the first project uh, we named 
cow project. The cow means face in Japanese. So this is a face, cow. The, the uh, idea of the project, we are looking for the face of the uh, city and uh, through the, the researching from the body. And so this is a project what we try to do now. Uh, this is a, a project for the uh, revitalization and the reconstruction of, of the station plaza of Kitamoto Station. Uh, Kitamoto, where it is, is a very um, unfamous <laughs> city, north part of Japan, uh, north, north part of Tokyo, there. This is Tokyo, and here, and here. And this is the station uh, train and the main station and the river and uh, some so far farmer's area and some farmer's area. And uh, or this is already the urbanized area. So it's a part, kind of the suburban city, but also the, it, uh, the history from the very ancient time. Uh, so because of the, this river is also connected from the uh, Tokyo Bay, so the, this river gives also very important traffic from the, the harbor to the, to the mountain. The, this is the history. So the very old, the village existing here. And then the, at first, the, the village uh, or city were developed uh, as a part of the, the riverside city. And also there are some new uh, street coming from the, from the Kamakura uh, government side. And also Edo period, the, there is also another some, some main uh, street from the center of the Edo. And then also the train comes the, after the uh, modernization. And then the start to the area, the center of the city were uh, uh, urbanized, some so big housing development. And also that they wanted to make a connection uh, between the river and the river, and then some kind of so horizontal the connection. And then now, here it is. And then the, this is a map of the, the green area, so still existing in the city. And uh, you can find a farm, some forest and the rice field. And also then next to the station, uh, train station. So also there is a, some so forest for heritage. So this is a, a place so forest. In the the city wanted to preserve the, some greener area as an uh, identity of the city. And also the, some of the NPO uh, tried to make uh, activate the event under the forest, and also making some so new event with the kids. But this city has uh, also the very, uh, my very so large, the population structure problem. So in, I think uh, all over the world, and uh, also in Japan, and uh, here too. So we had a very weak, bad the structure, uh, population, population structure. Like this uh, baby boomer after the World War II, that they are going to uh, aging and after, uh, after 10 years. So that they started to have a, a uh, lot of um, uh, they, 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 they is also a lot of problem of the estimation of the government uh, budget. And uh, that's the city mayor wanted to uh, think about the, this kind of the balance of the population structure, and also that he have the uh, worried about the the in the future uh, problem of the aging society in, of uh, Kitamoto. And uh, he had uh, one idea for uh, making uh, the uh, plaza in front of the station. Now, the, the, this is a view of the station plaza today. So it's very so occupied by car traffic, just only. So there is uh, no uh, plaza for the people. So the idea, uh, the city mayor, uh, the, he wanted to uh, reconstruct to making the plaza uh, through the uh, conversation with the people. But uh, there is no strategy uh, uh, from the city government. So the, they asked to, asked to 
help them to make a kind of structure of the conversation and also the design too. And this, in, this is a station and then my, it was the 40 years ago. The, it's almost the rice field and then they start to make uh, the station plaza so like this. And then you see the some of the, the urbanized situation and then this is the today. So you see the very different situation of dense. And uh, for this uh, commission, so Atri uh, Bawa, and uh, also I have a laboratory in my University of Tsukuba. So I uh, propose to the uh, city to make a kind of uh, structure of the conversation. Uh, it takes a long time, so now we are here. Uh, the, it started to the 208. And at the first, just we started to talk the planning meeting with the city. This is the city part, and uh, this is uh, the uh, people, uh, civil people part. And then so at first, we started to meeting with the uh, city. And the next year, so we started to divide two uh, side. One is a making meeting with the city, and the one is a ma using meeting with the people. And then the, it started to some sort of workshop and a social experiment and a town management lecture. It's a system of the public involvement and also talking the wider issue with the people. And then next uh, year, and we also uh, making an, another new activity like a market. And also the now, this is this year, um, the last year. So we started to another the civil uh, meeting. Uh, it's, a, it's a Cultivate Plaza uh, meeting, it's named. And then we started to make a kind of different the activities together uh, to discuss in this uh, meeting. And then in the next, uh, this year, uh, so we tried to make at first the civil platform the town management. And then in the future, so we would like to have a kind of a Kitamoto town management organization or company. And this is a system of the Kitamoto, how related to the University of Tsukuba in Antoribawa. So the Kitamoto city has a two big section for the making this uh, uh, plaza. One is the industry, uh, the civil economics section, and one is the urban development section. And an industrial tourism section uh, division uh, and uh, have a role of the management. And uh, these two section is a role of the making. And, uh, but there is no connection. There is uh, no people in between uh, former. So the, I asked to the mayor to hire the one uh, project manager for this project to, com to continue to the for long time, so like a four year or five years. And then uh, he hired one person who, uh, who has a big role for the connection in, in the city. And then also the uh, University of Tsukuba, uh, we have, um, well, we, this is uh, we, <laughs> uh, Momoyo and Yoshi. And uh, this is our uh, Atelier Bawa so family and a structure engineering light and a graphic and uh, our stuff. And then also we have uh, the laboratory in, uh, in our university and uh, we have a student and also we also ask some young uh, staff from the Kitamoto city. And also I have a very good colleague, the landscape design and universal design and town management design. So I asked to them to join this project. And also the mainly the city plaza was uh, uh, designed by the civil engineering consultant. So that means the mainly the we asked to them to change a lot of things. <laughs> and also the we uh, try to design a very nice roof. But it's also very good for them to civil engineering uh, consultant because they don't know exactly the, what is a uh, uh, space for the uh, for the people. <laughs> So the, the, this is very good, <laughs> the connection, how uh, we can make the nice plaza from both sides. And at first, uh, we try to ask the children what they want to do uh, in the plaza in the future, and also some of the mothers and also parents. And then they propose some very different the kind of sketches for them. And also the, in the, during the workshop, we ask them to the, in the, in the model, so what, 
what is the problem and what is the good things uh, in the model, for example. And also, the, uh, during the four years, uh, we try to always uh, make it the uh, social uh, experimentation. So that means that but this city is very conservative. Uh, everybody worried about the new things. That's why so we try to uh, show them to the what happened the, through these kind of things. So the, for example, sometimes we occupy the, the plaza, existing plaza, with the, this kind of cafe and also information center. And also, we try to make a sitting place, uh, making the uh, benches, uh, very so cheap materials of plywood, by uh, making by us. And also, that this is uh, almost not so looks like uh, architecture, <laughs> but uh, we also designed the uh, back uh, with the uh, newspaper, the folding by them by the people uh, together. This is also very good communication uh, method, uh, to, because everybody uh, worried about. Uh, the thinking, the plaza itself. But uh, if we started to make a workshop with the people and uh, just fall in the sh uh, sh shopping bag, but also that we can talk in the future. And um, this is also the, some experiment, uh, the occupation on the existing uh, the road uh, to put a lot of the market, uh, uh, market uh, shops and also some so sitting place. And also that this is a universal design, so that we rent the wheelchair, and then also the some so high school students help us to uh, try the, what is the problem today in the plaza. And also the one si uh, people are complaining us that we propose a very strange that triangle uh, roof for the uh, for the the traffic, but uh, everybody worried about the corner could not the turn by the uh, bus or uh, taxi. So the, we make a one-to-one -one big side of the route and then ask the bus to join the project. <laughs> and also the another the landscape designer, he is um, he uh, very uh, kind of the specialist of the making the forest. And then the traditionally Japanese forest cut every 30 years. The, to revitalize a new uh, sprout from the root. And then, but in the last uh, 50 years, there is uh, no uh, chance to cut because um, the energy revolution happened after and uh, turned to the oil uh, we use. So that make uh, no uh, management uh, for this uh, forest. So that's why, so in this case, uh, we try to make a kind of uh, knowledge to manage the forest too, and uh, we uh, make a kind of route, uh, this kind of new sprout route to bring to the uh, symbol of the plaza. And the uh, design, it's uh, kind of the balance, making the different balance from the uh, traffic to the people. So the, this is the yellow part is uh, the pedestrian part, and the uh, uh, gray part is the traffic and the green part is my uh, center green. So the, this is our existing uh, plaza, but we propose a different type of the balance. And then this is the last result. The, we try to make a plaza this here, and also center is a forest, and then triangle uh, my three side the root. And one side the bus, one side a uh, taxi, and one side a private car. And uh, this is, uh, and also that we propose the three big roof for uh, having the, the above the three uh, side of the triangle. Uh, this is a view of the, from the station. And this is a plaza, and the main plaza. And then, so you see the Samsa roof uh, from the here. And uh, this is the kind of building uh, process. Uh, it took uh, by the project manager uh, every day. <laughs> so he made a movie uh, like this.
Yes, <laughs> not finished. <laughs> and then uh, this is a photo. So the main big roof is a six meter, and this is a 4.5 meter high. So it's very big and simple and strong. Uh, but uh, we wanted to make a kind of soft the surface uh, with the uh, wood, uh, wood the material, uh, the timber material, like this. And then also the, in this project, we also uh, try to uh, make kind of um, uh, what we call caravan, so town management caravan. So that it's a, a vacant uh, shop uh, we occupied uh, with the caravan, so making the information center uh, with uh, the manager uh, from a uh, younger generation in Kitamoto. And in this case also the we propose uh, we make a drawing uh, the how the uh, plaza can be used by the people. And then also the we in Caravan, we have a meeting uh, to, to understand how we can manage the plaza, so with the people. And then now already the non under construction, the, the, but the, the plaza uh, start to open <coughs> as uh, the social em experiment. So the, this is a kind of candle, we call candle night. So love Kitamoto. So, and then so there's some so younger group that try to make uh, ac activate the plaza with a candle. And also the, this is a market. And uh, this is also the event uh, with different kind of uh, 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 city uh, people's uh, activi activities. And a band. And, and then another, so maybe five minutes left, yes. And <laughs> the five minutes, uh, I, I would like to show that from this experience, Kitamoto, that now we had a very big problem about the earthquake and the tsunami, and then what's happened in Japan uh, architecture uh, group. And then the, uh, this is, um, the, in the project name is the Arcade. And then so the after the uh, after the uh, earthquake, the March 16th, um, we start to have a meeting. So with what we can do as architect for this uh, program. And then but this project is a kind of the trial project in last summer. So uh, the title is uh, go to the peninsula. So that means peninsula is a. Uh, uh, here, this is a uh, uh, Japan, and then here this it this is a point of the earthquake happened, and then here this area has a long uh, 400 mm, sorry, uh, 400 kilometers something like so long, uh, the tsunami area happened, and then this is a main part of the damaged area. And here the this peninsula name is the Oshika Peninsula, so this is a. Peninsula, and uh, you see uh, so many uh, kind of so harbor and beach around the peninsula. So, and then this is a, a red area uh, attacked by the tsunami area. You see the so many the red part that happened in the, um, of this uh, uh, peninsula, and then. Actually, the, in the, the peninsula had uh, 30 uh, beaches, uh, fishermen's villages. And then in this uh, project, the 15 uh, architects laboratory in, in the university, uh, we, go, we went to there and uh, have our interview uh, the local people and then talk to them. And uh, uh, we tried to make uh, their needs uh, to more clearly by uh, vis visual, vis visual images. And um, so for example, the, this is uh, our part, uh, Momonora, the one of the beach is named the similar, my name is Momonora. So that's why so the, the project managers uh, ask, ask me to the help them. But anyway, so the, these three beaches, I, I went there. So this is an, uh, this is all in Japanese, but 15 so different the universities so from the University of uh, Tokyo and Hosei University 
and Kanagana University, Nagoya University, uh, yeah, so many universities, so including this project. And then all there, the architects uh, that also support, um, including this project. And then the workshop happened in the five days. And from the June, uh, July to July 20 to 24th, and the first and the field work and hearing and a proposal to the, the uh, people at the first time, and then <coughs> uh, next day also the again another proposal, and the last day so we uh, presented all the, in 30 uh, uh, villages together in the one uh, gymnasium of uh, the school. So this is our part. And uh, this is Momonora, and uh, this is um, uh, Tsukinora and the Samurai Hama. So these three is, uh, uh, is my, my so, uh, uh, research part. And then uh, originally the beach is uh, occupied by the fishermen's uh, houses. And uh, mainly these three uh, beaches or villages uh, the production of the oyster uh, field. So the, it's a really rich uh, quality oyster they made, but uh, all gone. This is a uh, picture the after the disaster. So the, it has a lot of the uh, um, house like this, but uh, it's all broken. And then uh, tsunami height is around here, the 10, 10 meter high. So the, you see that only some of the houses existing, but all house was gone to, to, the, to the ocean. And then also the, the level of the harbor was sinking uh, in one meter below almost. So that's why the, the uh, water level sometimes comes up to the, to the very high level. So that in that case, the people cannot use as a uh, harbor, uh, as normal way. But uh, some of the ship uh, uh, survived uh, from this um, the tsunami. And also so they, the fishermen tried to correct their instrument from the disaster. This is a shell for the oyster field. And then uh, this is ju ju Jan uh, July, uh, middle of July, the same time of the uh, workshop, but they already started to make the, the next season the oyster, so even in such a very uh, bad situation. And then they uh, started to make a uh, uh, field in the sea field. And then this area has also very beautiful, some of the temple or shrine above the hill. So that this is uh, still remain after the disaster. So it's also a very big symbol for the area. And then, yeah, now the there is a very, looks, my old beach is really beautiful, amazing uh, landscape. But uh, the, the only, if you see the, the ocean, there's nothing happened. It looks like nothing happened, but backside is really horrible. But uh, they have a lot of still the good culture is a well, and also the storm. And also some so field happened the, in the mountainside. The, this uh, field the covered by the fisherman's net for the uh, uh, protect the deers. And also this is uh, another the field. <coughs> so the, through the discussion, I tried to make a kind of the sketches from their needs uh, for their needs. Uh, for example, having the higher. Uh, kind of uh, on the on the hill that there is a new uh, some sort of houses and also that we I wanted to bring some so sort of field atmosphere uh, to to make a landscape again and uh, here is then some new beaches and there's a new uh, market place so this is a discussion and also that we I visit uh, with my students to ha to ask them that what they want to do in the future. And uh, we try to find out uh, the, the good uh, spot the, in a higher uh, hill uh, to they can move their house to more a uh, safe space. So the last day, so we have uh, this kind of discussion. So uh, 
um, I think I view um, the, the, this kind of the fisherman village that they have a very strong community, even if a uh, disaster. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, but um, we wanted to, uh, we want to help to, to, to do something so as an architect, maybe to, their, to them to give the kind of facilitate to the community in the future. Or maybe so encourage them to to think the future. So I don't know exactly now. We are just uh, the trying to do something, but um, I hope next time that I I can uh, explain more the better uh, proposal <laughs> or good condition uh, to them and to you. Thank you very much. All right, guys, so my name is Raul Cárdenas. I come from Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. I work in something called the Toro Lab. Well, you see, the Toro Lab is a weird collective effort in which we have the intentionality of being artwork, but then it's completely transdisciplinary. No? And so the results are always in conjunction to the ideas that people make of how to live better with a specific context. And with those ideas and those connections that could go from the very, uh, from luxury and opulence to survival and functionality. No? And it's those things that take hold into what we do. Um, the Total Lab, um, so basically what we do is that when we arrive into a context, and, and I speak in we because it's a collective effort. So if we do a project together here and we make a team, that team becomes a Total Lab team. Right, and for that context and for that particular project, we put a different mm, fluid, fluid team. So one of the things that you have to understand about our work is that when you deal with ideas of quality of life, you deal with certain poetics that are very unique to the subject. And the project that I'm going to present to you guys today deal with certain things that the Mexican government has been working on, the project that I selected, two are in Mexico, three are in Mexico. And, and basically when you ask a politician about quality of life in Mexico, they, they start to tell you about the levels of poverty. There are three basic uh, strategic levels of poverty in Mexico that, that the government use, which is patrimonial poverty, the um, capacity poverty, and nutritional poverty, which is the worst and the one that hurts the most. And, and, and then if you live in a country in which, well, they say that 56% of the people live under, under poverty level and 16% live under the conditions of poverty that the UN can really measure, no, well, uh, could we really think uh, and, and use it this idea of condition of poverty and turn it around into, into a social and economical resource possibility of, a, of a strategic uh, development. I really don't know. But what we're going to try to see over here is uh, work it out in four different aspects. And the, the, the first one that I want to tell you about 
deals with the context where I live, which is Tijuana. And yes, there is something to say about the ideas of representation of modernism, right, and monuments. And this, this particular image is, it, the, at the time when you had the prohibition of alcohol in the United States and in the 20s, uh, in Tijuana, post-revolutionary Tijuana, they, they, they make the casino of Tijuana, right? And, 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 and I love the idea of the casino in Tijuana with these gold holes in where they were, you know, betting with, with, with gold coins, right? And, and, and Al Capone used to go there. And, and, and then in the 1929, they built the, the horse race track deal over here, you know? And, 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 and everybody from Hollywood has started to go to Tijuana. I'm sorry. It, the majority should know, but Tijuana is a border town, a border city. No, which is basically based between Mexico and the United States in the, in the context of California, dividing the city of San Diego and, of course, Tijuana. And, and for the people who have been there, you know that when you visit Tijuana and you cross the border, you actually don't travel to Tijuana. You just cross the line and you're there. They're conurbated. But, well, just to continue, right? And, 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 and then comes this guy, General Lázaro Cárdenas right in 1935 that I think is at the same time that they finished the Hoover Dam. And this very dramatic, severe guy, and I think he was my <laughs> uncle, um, <laughs> the, the, the man decided to tear down the casino because it didn't belong to the ideals of the revolution and the construction of the modern citizen of Mexico, right? What did he do? Well, he built a federal high school. Right, a federal high school, he tore it down, and the only thing that he left was a minaret, no, because it was, you know, a Moorish architecture deal, right? And then he built m my second favorite monument in the world, which is the monument to the textbook, no, that we all have, <laughs> no, and the kids trying to reach the textbook, you know, and, 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 and it's basically about that, but, but what it really means for me. If you think about it, because the casinos in, Tijuana, in Las Vegas uh, it, it started to go until the 50s and the 60s with the Aladdin in 61 and all that. Well, imagine this is actually a monument about the reconstruction of the geographical territory of economics of the western side of the United States and Mexico, right? And, and here comes Hannes Meyer. You guys got Walter Gropius over here. The guys in Chicago went with Miss Van der Rohe. We got Hannes, right? <laughs> and, and, and he went to the Polytechnic to help out do the macro planning of the city of Mexico City. Of course, the politics of Mexico started to make this man mad. And, 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 and the representation again. No, the, the Mexican Union of Socialist Architects of 38, in which instead of drawing, they were doing diagrams. And instead of calling a couple, a couple, they call it, como se dice, una reproductive unit, right? <laughs> and, and then we have Tijuana and our representations of the power of modernism that kind of look at other things. No, uh, we have our arches, uh, but, but at least the one that we have holds a clock that doesn't work, no? And, and, uh, and our statue, which is basically in the, in the Liberty neighborhood, right? But, but there is other types of monuments that I'm interested in that held certain representations, and they are within these small acts that you start to establish the programs of people. Here I want to go and say, th th this project that I'm going to show you is one of our oldest projects because it started in 1995. This one in particular started in 1997. It's, called, it's from a series called Emergency Architecture. Emergency Architecture is not architecture of disasters, but, but you can do with, possibil with the possibilities that you have when you have, uh, how do you say this, your necessity so close to, to, to ideas of survival. With that in mind, we, our work that goes from diagnostics to systems. And some systems continue for years, right? And the diagnostic only help us out. And when you deal in a country that 70% of the population and the construction of housing is informal, right, uh, uh, and, and is of outer construction, you really have to work on these ideas of micro-planning, of micro-politics, of dealing with the necessities of the individual. Because when you have a macro-plan and you have your numbers wrong, and when you think that Tijuana has 
uh, one million and a half persons. And then over 15 years ago, there was a census that said from the private sector that said that Tijuana had 2,600,000 persons. And how do you mean miss 1,100,000 persons? Because you live between velocity and, and, and movement, between uh, uh, formality and informality. There is a lot of reasons. But what we started to do with one of our projects, this is called the region of the transborder trousers, and it was something in which we started to measure the, the, the tracking movement of people trying to cross the border and who couldn't and who could cross the border and went from LA to Ensenada, from Tijuana to Mexicali. And one of the things that came out of this project from the very beginning was this auto construction system out of three materials of international transaction that somehow if you follow the lines of consumption, you would understand how this particular zone works using tires, uh, used garage doors from San Diego, and, and, and pallets from the maquiladoras in Mexico, in Tijuana, which basically is the monitor capital of the world. And now they do biotechnology things for hard uh, systems. They do the telecommunications for NASA. It's a quite sophisticated town in that aspect. But it has this other aspect of informality. So what we did, we took a person that worked for the Sanjo Corporation. And, and this lady has a real job, but cannot afford social housing. You know, the lowest income housing there is. So it, it, she, we helped her. You know? So she designed her own house. And I truly love the design that she came about you know, with the with the tires and the, I, I won't go through the December, but I really, really enjoy it. But if we make this house within the context where she lives, and we don't do something around the context itself, well, we're adding a problem to her life for a lot of reasons. So we asked her to be part of the Total Lab team. And she said, what I'm going to do? Well, you're going to find other eight families that you want to share your life with, that you want your kids to grow up with. No? And we're making these modular uni units no, that grow, that grow, no, with, with, with this idea of nine families. And there is a lot of uh, reasons why this is the number nine. And, 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 and so we started to design this thing and work in this. We, I love these fluid territories that are in between things. Those are the perfect territories for us to move. And this is, is in between a gated community and a community that doesn't have gates at all. No? And, but one thing happened to this project, that's the reason that I'm showing you, it's on pause. And it's on pause because of political connection with people who were supporting our project. So I put a pause on this section of this deal, and we moved to something called molecular urbanism. Molecular urbanism is, let me tell you briefly, small interventions into the human body that somehow changes the pattern of your life. And if that happens, because you're either growing thinner or fatter, your hair is growing or falling or you're sweating more, whatever it might be that somehow changes the pattern of your life, you change the immediate relationship that you have with your space. If that happens to your neighbors you know, and your friends and your sons and your couple, well, then there is something within the environment that is facilitating these changes to occur. We have gone to two, two routes. Uh, one that deals with the idea of temperature and change of temperament, and we're doing a project in the city of Culiacán, Sinaloa at the moment. And the one that I'm going to show you about, which is the relationship about the physiognomical changes of the Mexican personas with their everyday relationship with food, and then how the city changes because of that equation. And what we found, and I'm telling you this is from 2005, uh, uh, at that time, uh, there, there was not a lot of talk like there is right now, but what we found at that time is that Mexico was the second fattest nation in this continent, and of course you guys were the fattest, <laughs> no? <laughs> and, but there were other problems, no? More dire problems, like uh, 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 things like diabetes mellitus is a... Is a uh, uh, it's an epidemic, and epidemics used to be viral, not behavioral. No, and, and, but it's easier to get two liters of Coke than two liters of water and eat the same distributor. The biggest problem, just to make a long, long story short, is that we are malnourished. And when you combine malnourishment with uh, obesity, with extreme poorness, that's a disaster at, uh, at the level of an earthquake, but with different temporality. No? And so, we started to make a map, and we tried to make a map, and then the map didn't make sense at all. What we did, we, we, we did a map, and the map came out to be that food product over there. 
And if you eat that food product without the thing that it's inside, just the bread, because we try to do a hybrid between a tortilla and a bread, technically it's a bread, and, 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 and if you eat it, it has all the missing elements in the Mexican diet, ac according to the last census of health, in terms of vitamin E, B, C, E, ferrum, iron, and calcium. No, the only thing missing is B12, but that comes in animal protein, so you got to add cheese or something, and if you are a vegan, you're in trouble. And and we, uh, and we work very close to the, to the PhD uh, department of food engineering of University of Las Americas to do this thing in Puebla. And we chose the city of Puebla for two reasons. Because if we wanted to do the thermometer and this outlook of how Mexico has changed, Puebla was perfect. It was the first place where the syncret uh, syncretism uh, o o of the viceroyship of Spain you know, met with the, with the pre-colonial people. No? And when you think about mole, you think about mole poblano, no black mole of Oaxaca or stuff like that. And when they're trying out new food products for the Coca-Cola Corporation, Frito-Lay, Bimbo, uh, all these people, they try it out in Puebla instead of Mexico City, Monterrey, or Guadalajara, right? So it was a perfect thermometer. So, but now it didn't fit in the freaking museum. So we built this, 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 this uh, new oven right, that, that, that tried to be an heterogeneous design, no, in which it wouldn't uh, take away the people who had money and, and the people who were poor. We gave a good price to this thing, and we did a cooperative with, 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 with students of architecture, music, uh, gastronomy, and visual arts, no, that have this performatic <laughs> aspect about them, because it's not only what you eat, it's how you eat it. But that's another conversation. So. Well, uh, and then I'll tell you about the ad campaign with the taggers of the city and the four trucks of distribution of Coke. And, but every time whether we put it out, we sold out. Every time. And the first person who wanted to buy our product were the people who made the tasting for Coca-Cola, Bimbo, and frito The From molecular urbanism, I want to tell you briefly about home territories, the idea of homeland. It, it's just an archive of ideas. If, if we think about how we construct the microorganisms of the city and how we can start to grow. Before you design a home and you design the streets and everything, it's how you construct the idea of the home territory. But if we start talking about what is normality, well, we will never get into a middle point. But when we st start seeing what is in the edge of normality, no, well, then we can all agree that nomadic people, extreme migration, uh, 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 refugee people are in those extremes, and if we make case studies of those things, we can add into this archive. I'm going to go really briefly about this because uh, we, we, we worked this with the San Francisco Art Institute. We started to work with some people called the Yumian people. I don't know if you have heard about it. It's it, it close related to the Hmong people, but it's like saying like that, that uh, Mexican people are close related to Cubans and poor Cubans. No? But, <laughs> They live between Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, and, 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 and China. M a lot of them in Laos, they help the American government in the Vietnam War. They don't have a written language. It's not that they don't cannot read and write. The majority are bilingual and write in, in Chinese. And, but, but basically, a lot of people, when the, these guys help in the Vietnam War, they, the American government went away. A lot of them went to Laos and got bombarded for people. Others went to Thailand and put them in refugee camps. That is just a, a politically correct name for places that were not so nice. No? And this is uh, the main character in our story, Liu Sheng. And, and we started to follow the life of Liu Sheng because a lot of them started to, these people are nomadic. But they're in a weird nomadic place in which they travel every 10 years building farms. And then they leave it, and then they go. And it's part of their shamanic religion and everything. And now in a 10-year period from 1975 to 1985, where they started to get help, they, they got situated in Seattle, Washington, in Portland, in Oregon, in Sacramento, California, and the majority in Oakland. So with the San Francisco Art Institute, we found this place in Oakland. We started to find the life of this person and how the construction of language in which they don't have a written language. And this thing that helped out with them, because they, they helped out the American government, because either the Vietnamese nor the Chinese could understand what they were saying, now was an, a weapon against them, because they couldn't learn English 
in a good way when they arrived and their kids who learned English, they talked an affected English but didn't speak Yumyang and started to have a, you know, these weird silence relationships within each other. And then the man, no, maybe he was, you know, a, an incredible businessman in Laos and now he's just the janitor of a school. So he starts using drugs and he becomes this a figure for the kid who is uh, immature and sees as the only reference to the culture and wants to get away. And the only one person who is in the middle ground and trying to be better is the woman. Because when you were in Laos, you could have been the third wife of a guy who was not nice. And you, by shamanic law, you could only take care of the kids or uh, and not participate in, in religion. And now they're the persons who become like the engagement to the community, some of them. So we started to follow their life, and just to make a long story short, in order to construct the construction of their story, we have to build an organic farm with them. No, a six acres organic farm outside Oakland. We started to, to, to farm the, 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 the vegetable that they were farming, but, and, and then we started to sell it to schools, uh, uh, elementary schools in Oakland with other organic farms. We got a grant from the USDA. No, and then we sold it outside, but then the people of the America didn't want it to buy our long red green beans because they didn't know how to cook them. So we started to make some uh, cooking videos to understand what we were producing. And, and, uh, but then that became part of the archive but we, because when the translations came, you, you hear them like if they're cooking and one says, oh, you remember when, when the translation came, when they got my kid and they raped my daughter and killed my husband. So we were really not going to sell a vegetable with this thing. <laughs> but we were going to be able to have a very important piece of their heritage. And I'm going to go ahead because we, we, we have to move on. But again, Tijuana. Tijuana, uh, you see right here is uh, San Diego, Tijuana. And Tijuana is now eating up Rosarito and Tecate. And it's becoming a metropolis. Right, and they call it the strategic metropolitan plan of Tecate and Rosarito, right? And where we are at this point is is like this: we we have to question the the work of people like me in a word that we have been talking about with you and with Felipe, which is gestión and gestión because it, it, it it's not really management or 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 only management or only negotiation. It's like both. No, and I love that word in Spanish. But you have to think of the design of, of gestión in, in order to perform this type of work. And you have to deal with very specific context of political situation in Mexico in which once the, this one party fell down, now you have all these parties and they have very different ideas and not really the construction of a nation. No, but a, but a political agenda and other specific constructions. So you have to work in between those lines. So you have to start working with the civil society. There is something called Tijuana Innovadora, the CDT, the Urban Planning Commission, which is one party, and the federal government and state government, which is another mm -hmm. party. No, and we had to work within each other. I don't know how this happened, but this pause button that happened in the first project was not going to happen to me again. I started to participate in all of them, and now it seems I'm working for the Urban Planning Commission. No, and they, 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 they have, this is their urban strategy thing, and it's economy and the environment. Oh, Jesus. And the, and, and the border and stuff by national, and I'm the director of the creative digital metropolis. No, and, and, and I'll tell you after what, what the hell does that mean, right? And, but, but one of the things is that they really listen, and now they're going to call it the, me, the, the, the innovation metropolis and the network of creative cities. And my job is to build in a creative environment so I can invite you guys over and help us out, no? And one of the things that I want to show you about the last thing, which is a running project. I'm, I'm, am I doing fine? More or less? All right. Uh, so. So this is Tijuana, and this is the poverty levels. The, 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 the lighter the color, no, is worse. No, uh, this right here is, again, the people who are uh, the places that crimes are being committed. No, and again, in this one, this is the people who are in jail for violent crimes in the city. Right? So we arrived to this neighborhood, Camino Verde. Camino Verde had a horrible history. In 1993, it had this 
flood that happened over here, you know, and, and, and people drowned in mud. It was horrible. First they say it was 14, and then there were dozens and dozens of people who got lost, you know. And now it's becoming part of this political discussion because they make this channel for water, and then they make these uh, streets over here, but then the rest of it is completely without electricity. Some of them, it doesn't have drainage. Some of them, it has. But because of the people who do have a paved street and electricity and water, they don't call it completely poor. And it's the place that has more poor people per square meter in the state, right? So we started a discussion with the Ministry of Social Affairs. No? And, 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 and my job is to start making a participatory uh, base for other people to come and start intervening in this place. And now it's my job to do my own participation. And the participation falls into the program of the Transborder Farm Lab. It's part of something we call the Society of Agents of Change and the Creative Economies Initiative. What happened with this, when we say transborder, we don't only mean the border, but the, trans but the, the, the border of disciplines. And the farming is not only the food product that we're going to have, that we will have, but also the farming of ideas no, and projects. No, if it, this is a project about the relationship between the development of city and food, but if you work in a place that has nutritional poverty, at the end it has to have economical vocation. It cannot be otherwise. Before you have other programs, it has to be like this. No? So we started to make this base of, uh, we're working in a perimeter that has 40,000 uh, people. No, and then we are working in a small perimeter of 1,000 homes that has, on average, that has 16,000 persons, so it's, uh, it's ridiculous, right? And we're working with eight families that represent the, the, the spectrum that goes from normal poor people to people who eat four days a week uh, tortilla, salt, and coke, no? And that really changes, and that's when molecular urbanism comes about. No, if, if you start thinking, the way even language changes, because there are certain nutrients that don't allow you to have certain synapses in your brain. That we, that, so it's a lot of things that want to be. No, we're, we're doing this biomap to understand now the changes into their body to have different indicators about quality of life. We're making a movie. Well, we're not actually the, the nice guys of the School of Rents in the art department are doing it for us. No, they, we have them over there in Tijuana. No, and we're doing the campus. In the campus selection, and for a lot of the interventions happen, these are the crimes reported in the last uh, six months in this place. And right here is where we have one part of our campus. No, and, 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 and this campus is going to be an academic campus, and we will talk more about this. And I will ask your help, and don't listen to this architectural draft that I have, but we need help from architects to help us out. No, and, and the economical products that have to do with fruit, vegetables, uh, 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 water management, some fishing, and, 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 and a TV show that is like a migrant. Everybody in that neighborhood is a migrant. And everybody has a story. And imagine that this is just uh, like a travel show, but backwards. Instead, uh, we're already in the place. Now we're going back to this migrant route through this idea. And this becomes another economical. And this one, I won't have time to speak a lot, but this is just a connection between the bridge, no, uh, between formality and informality. And I have to wrap up, and I'm sorry. And there you go. I think I'm going to follow Neil's uh, strategy of, of um, piling up some questions. Rahul has told me that we, we can go 20 more minutes or so. There's plenty of time for lunch, so don't worry. You'll be able to talk among yourselves over lunch. But we'll try to do a one round of questions if that's enough. And we'll, you know, if that takes all our time, fine, and we'll have comments from our speakers. So does anybody want to start with a question? Comment? One in the back. Identify yourself a little, Joyce. Yeah, I am Joyce Rosenthal of the GSD. Um, what gets the sense from reading newspapers that drug violence has altered public life in all border cities in Mexico? 
And I wonder if you could discuss if there's any interaction between your work with public space and communities, um, you know, interacting with this type of phenomenon going on in Mexico today. Thanks. In the case of my work, we're, we're, we're going we're to pass it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no others, you're going to get to go, really. Yes. Uh, um, thank you. And uh, my question is for Raul, and thanks for an amazing um, presentation. Um, so what I just wanted you to reflect on, what I was, I was struck by many things, um, so I probably have a lot more questions afterwards, but just the one for now is this last bit that you showed us where you're now the director for creative cities or something uh, something ridiculous like that. Um, what has happened to your your methodological approach around, um, I can't even remember the term, um, your urbanism, what do you call it? The molecular urbanism, right? And are you having now to traverse these different scales? And obviously from what you've shown, you're trying to you're still remaining committed to using the fine grain as the lens for thinking about larger patterns. But um, presumably, though, it is taking you into the granular, right? I mean, into, into, the, into the coarse granularity of the, of the territory. So can you reflect on how you know, you're thinking differently about, um, about uh, this fine grain urbanism that you're interested in? Yes. And, um, and and what does it, what else does it need? What does it have to talk to at this regional scale, right? Because that's what you're constructing. You haven't yet named it, uh, but it's obviously not the same thing anymore. And so I'm interested in in, in kind of what that that, that, that evolution is. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ardan from uh, the GSD, and uh, I had a question on resilience and how it connects with molecular uh, urbanism, because like living organism also develop uh, concepts and methods of resilience. And we talked about obesity and compared it to an uh, earthquake uh, in terms of impact, but different temporality, and it was very interesting, and you also showcased some uh, flooding issues. So how does the city, um, through your molecular urbanism approach, develop some resilience into its fabric. Do we have any other questions? Or maybe I'll add one uh, I kind of that summarizes this, this set of questions, and it really opens it out to both of our panelists. I was thinking myself about this um, through serendipity because of the earthquake in Japan, but we have today two presentations that are thinking about planning practice and practices from below in the context of disaster or destruction. If we could put violence, poverty is, is a disaster and destruction. We have earthquakes, ranges of destructive contexts in which um, people are making their everyday lives, trying to remake their everyday lives, and states are trying to remake them. And I'm just wondering whether you could share whether you think those processes are different in places where there's disorder, to use kind of again the parallel with a prior panel, versus order. I mean, that's also one thing to think about the context of the discussion in the prior panel of European orders are relatively well established and accepted. And here we're talking about two play. Of course, Japan is interesting because you have a strong traditionality in the culture of order, but a context of disorder. So um, does, is planning different in those contexts? It's really just another way of thinking about the three uh, questions that we've had um, on the table. So why don't we see, Mama, would you like to start? You want Rahul to start? <laughs> All right, so the first question, let me see this. I have the utmost respect for you guys. This is like a memory you know, exercise. So <laughs> the, the, the first, and, and the relationship with the ideas of violence in connection to these uh, environments and their work. Look, um, the, the, the condition with border towns is quite unique, and especially in the border town of Tijuana. And you will understand if I can convince you to visit at some time because it is the only violent town in, did I say that correctly, violent place in, in Mexico that is actually turning the violence around, 
No, it is the only one right now. It's becoming a model. And this uh, Merida Initiative against the drug wars in, uh, from the United States and Mexico is all the way to the fourth pillar, in which they're already beyond this condition of giving arms and you know facilitating the soldiers to be better and all these things to social engagement. No, and and. And, and this is unique because four years ago, and somebody, if, if, if you were living four years ago, it was something else. It, it came to a point, about five, in which there are two conditions in Tijuana, which is maquiladoras and uh, 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 people who visit Tijuana. No, it's the biggest uh, land border in the world, the, the most transited land border in the world. And, and, and all of a sudden, 90% of the people from outside who were visiting Tijuana, 90% stopped going. No, so so there is a lot of things to say about civil uh, civil society in this case because a lot of people we stay, and and they just trust me. And there's people who live there. There is something different about sleeping in Tijuana and in San Diego, even if it's so very close. No, and, and it's unique and it gives a wonderful perspective in San Diego, but it's quite unique and something else in in Tijuana. Well. The, the conditions about border towns in the case of Tijuana has this condition of self-managed civil society trying to take over certain things. And it's not only poor people. Think, no, these are people who are uh, you know, patrons of industry and people like that saying, all right, let's do something. No, I can give you an example, but I have to continue this memory. Yeah. Uh, should I continue? Well. Well, uh, uh, people want to eat lunch and we want to hear from Momo, but we want to hear from you too. So. <laughs> Continue a little. <laughs> okay, Momo. Let's negotiate this a no, little here. here. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, my destruction. My, I think, my, uh, what, like, like uh, the seven samurai, so that. Japanese the city or Japanese village were very, very so closed, kind of so inclusive somehow so to the community. And then in that case, in the, for example, town management, how we can do uh, for the new things. The one thing is crazy man can change or uh, young people can change. So there is a kind of thesis. And a crazy means maybe uh, creation, creative people too can be, or artists, or I don't know exactly the, uh, maybe so architects also can do something. And then so it's uh, always coming from the outside or inside, uh, sometimes well, inside younger generation, so that they can reach the kind of new, uh, new idea or new structure uh, to to encourage the society, and then my seven samurai, my, the samurai are like these kind of things. Maybe that they uh, support the community, but also that they after the, their role, they kill or they die. <laughs> In, so that means or kick out to the to the society. So the this kind of things maybe the, in a very strong community it needs some kind of the role the, to to uh, distract distract or uh, the kind of how do you change the society uh, from outside and then. Mm, a samurai could be like this, and architect might may, might be this kind of role when it happens. And also the maybe it's a disaster, uh, this kind of tsunami or earthquake we have a lot, or typhoon. Uh, so in Japan we have a lot of the climate issue, and uh, this is also very good challenging for making the new things or new new structure things, and then. Mm, I don't know exactly. I cannot uh, uh, compare the exactly the European culture or another culture or Mexican culture, but um, when so society needs always something this kind of the condition to to activate the society itself. So I don't know how we can make it not by only disaster 
want to make more uh, people <laughs> itself, I hope, or violence, I don't know exactly. But uh, uh, this kind of, um, um, kind of um, pressure from outside or pressure from inside, it's very helpful for thinking to the, to the future. So the, I think that's why the, uh, yeah, if in these two cases, and uh, yeah, uh, I feel it's a very strong intention of the role of the actors. Thank you. Mm. Yes, we have some questions here. Actually, I, I very much enjoyed both presentations. Michael Manfredi. Um, uh, Momo, I, I think, and, and this is a question too for Raul, I, I was struck on well, the case of your first project, there was a very slow maturation, uh, gathering a kind of consensus around the community. The design seemed, at least as it was presented, that it evolved slowly, so it was a kind of a, a very careful calibration between the form and the process. Um, on the other hand, when there's a disaster, as in the case of the tsunami, that whole process, which we all love and believe it, like religion, it has to happen, you don't have that opportunity. You have to go quickly, you have to improvise, you have to sort of put forth, uh, project very, very quickly without the body of uh, significant research. Uh, true also, I think, in some of the uh, projects that you talked about, well, I was curious about your uh, take on that uh, when you don't have the kind of uh, the, uh, the luxury of time and a large body of research to support an interactive process. So yeah, yeah. I think I think yeah. It's very and time is very important issue for thinking the process, and um, yeah. I think, for example, in Kitamoto case, uh, we have enough time. And then during that process also, that there is a big poli political election <laughs> too. Because uh, in Japan, I think uh, we have a big two party, the Liberty Party or Civil Liberty Party, Minshito, uh, Jiminto, two party. And then uh, originally the Jiminto is coming from the, the farmer's place. And then the <coughs> Minshito, uh, civil liberty party is coming with a new generation, and then so and then for example Kitamoto case that there is a well, it's exactly the same the farmers place and the new uh, migrant part from Tokyo or some other case and then there is a now the very is a big kind of sort of concurrence uh, from the both side of different generation and then uh, but uh, our idea is a mixed up the two sides the we uh, promote also the kind of green out uh, landscape from the uh, farmers culture and to to meet the urban people so that case uh, they have a problem of the existing uh, fighting <laughs> they cannot uh, simply negotiate it <laughs> each other so that's the last moment the election of the mayor is second stage is very important. Mm -hmm. So that's why so we have to wait one year for discussion and campaign. <laughs> but uh, the last April, the election was happening and then the former mayor was uh, won, won. So that's why the finish to continue. Mm -hmm. So, but I think uh, uh, I feel that sometimes the politics is uh, not only the uh, oriented to the to the uh, to not only for the answer a good answer more than kind of the existing uh, community fight. <laughs> so that I feel um, if we can ignore this kind of existing fight to bring a more good uh, result, I hope uh, it's much better or nicer the answer we can get. But uh, in fact, it's very difficult. So we take a time. And then I think uh, the tsunami case, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's really so all happening at once. And then now then nothing. And then government have a no uh, structure for the uh, revival, revival, revival uh, 
division. So the, the 1st of the February is a new uh, section of the uh, government study for the revive, revival so structure. But uh, now it's happened so. And then, but uh, still I feel a lot of structure of the, of the government uh, policy. It makes a lot of the kind of difficulty to connect more simply. For example, Fisherman Town or Fisherman's Village in, in physically it's a very simple town. But harbor is uh, occupied by harbor section. And uh, for example, living area is uh, owned by the uh, kind of land the section. And also community part is uh, education section. <laughs> so the all different, uh, even if the same place, but a lot of the division happened by the governmental issue. So the, my, our role also the how we can negotiate in a different side and how we can make a good vision for all to, to facilitate, the, to activate all different kind of uh, uh, division. So I, so that thing is a uh, physical uh, so vision is really important for getting goal. So that, that's why so we draw a lot of things uh, to propose to show the visual images for the, everybody to get more clearly. Okay. I think I see one more question from the audience. Uh, Alex, do you have a question? And then we will let he, Raul respond. And if there's, if it, your other questions are relevant to you as well, and then we'll wrap up because I'm. Alex, for your JC, I actually. You began to answer the question I was about to ask. Okay. So, <laughs> so just maybe one more step. I, I'm curious, because the panels were so different, I'm curious about either earlier panelists or these panelists might talk about what the potential linkages might be between the kind of the state formal policy-oriented realms and the kind of micro-urbanism informal as-you-go realms. Because that would be interesting. Are those two realms forever separated by various <laughs> issues, or are there some ways in which either Lou's profession or others might begin to find some tentacles that connect them? Mm -hmm. okay. Nice big question. Um, you want to? Sure. Well, it, one of the things that I wanted to say, and maybe it, it connects a little bit to other questions that were asked before, is about this idea of this word that I said that is gestión, which is in between management and negotiation. Right? And, and, and the idea of civil society as a leverage point in order to make this three partisanship situation in Mexico, who go from extreme right to extreme, extreme left, right, it, it make something out of it. Because if we take something about the last panel in which you were mentioning about the, the, the when, when hap what, what happens when, when, when you have bending of the rules? And then when the bending of the rules become the norm, what about if the bending of the norm become the norm of the government itself? And then this informality becomes part of the lingo of something that you are making in, as an agency from the bottom up. Uh, I don't know if you mean. So probably it's a question also about communication. Truthfully, for example, this deal of what they are making me do in the government, uh, more than just administrating projects, no, I'm really making people talk and from different levels, because all come from different parties, right? And then, uh, finally, projects that were, that come from bottom up are at least being on pause. Uh, no, but, but it's not my decision, no, it's, it's just the, maybe the resilience of people who are advocating this type of work and just making those connections happen. I don't know if that really answers it, but I can talk some more. In, did you want to say yeah. well, one thing maybe is uh, that now in Japan is a public involvement to the to the policy is very important issue because uh, net lack of the tax or net you know, the because of the production uh, population is a gaining age and then that make uh, less the tax uh, to the, the to the city. That means the public involvement is very important, and the public participant to the to the city government is also very important. Mm -hmm. And then 
is uh, this is this our work is also framework of thinking this kind of a structure mm -hmm. of the society. And then tsunami also already a lot of things happen in the, from the people itself. So not only uh, ask to the government because that government has gave up some part of the uh, first uh, moment. So the people have to care each other from the community. <coughs> Uh, mm -hmm. That is really, I think, uh, basically, that is very important for mm -hmm. making the society. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. Well, I, I know we, uh, I already saw a few people now want to get involved in the conversation because we've got a new stimulating um, angle, but we're going to have to have lunch. I want to say, <laughs> as a summary comment, thank you, Alex, for asking that question. I think it's a provocative and important one. Maybe we can carry it forward during the lunchtime, this idea, not not just of the analytics of the first and the second panel, if I could throw something on that, the way in which crisis as a concept maybe allows us to think about the analytics differently. So in the case of the states and regulation, economic crisis is a huge thing that unifies Europe and the United States these days. And do we see the kind of innovative self-reconstruction in the states that we're seeing in the private sector civil society that you mentioned in, in a place like Tijuana or in Japan. Do we, is crisis something that unifies or creates, splits old binaries and creates new ones? Or is there something else? Or they will ever be on different paths? So I, I invite everybody to continue the discussion at lunch, and we'll be back at 3 o'clock. Thank you, everybody.